Hi guys, hope you had the opportunity to take a look at session 7 on head trauma. Now we are going to move on to um, trauma of the chest, abdomen and spine and something called central cord syndrome. Of course if you want extensive information on trauma, I suggest you go to dearnurses.com and read more on the trauma topics. There you'll be able to find just a heap of clinical information that will help you if you work in the emergency room or an IC or even on the surgical floor when you have a trauma patient come in. Now talking about what happens in the emergency room. When your patient comes into the emergency room, it's, I know it's a little bit intimidating. I mean for the new clinical nurse if you're not familiar with this sort of environment. but you, there are things that you will know that a patient who's had trauma has probably got blood all over them. You need to watch their vital signs very closely because they always have that potential for going into shock. If you take a look at the patient in uh, number one, you'll notice that he's got the cervical collar on, his spine is immobilized, which is typical of what happens with a trauma patient. You don't want the spine to be flip-flopping all over the place so they wind up having a permanent spinal injury, a cervical collar in place until the doctor gives permission to remove that collar. Of course, the spine has to be x-rayed first to make sure there is no damage. In number two, you will notice that this patient is very short of breath. And there are any number of variables why a patient can be short of breath. In the case of what we will describe today is a pneumothorax. A pneumothorax actually is what happens in the case of the patient with a pneumothorax, you get air enter in the pleural space. Typically it happens when there is a penetrating uh, wound, like a stab wound, a gunshot wound. Sometimes it might even happen from just a car accident if there's fractured ribs and it punctures, uh, the, goes into the, uh, the lung. Air enters the pleural cavity and what it does in the pleural space, it collapses the lung. So instead of being filled, the lung, it just compresses the lung that whole area becomes just full of air, patient has a lot of difficulty breathing and if you look at the trachea on the opposite side there's an obvious deviation because remember air has filled that area. The neck veins are very distended and that patient is extremely anxious and very short of breath. It's a very frightening feeling so if you have a patient who has this condition you really need to try to understand to decrease the leveling of anxiety don't get very stressed out with them. Try to um, give them as much assurance as you can. Make them feel comfortable. You need, they need oxygen. Of course, their vital signs monitored. You need to pay close attention to their breathing because they're very short of breath. You need to let the doctor know as soon as possible. Typically what happens, an x-ray is done. Once it's established, chest tubes are put in so that the air can be brought out of the pleural space to make breathing easier. Even after a chest tube is in place, it usually is x-rayed again to make sure it is in the right place. Um, patients like this, they'll only be in the ER for so long before they get on, sent on to the floor. We're going to talk a little about abdominal trauma. Abdominal bleeding is very tricky because you can have sometimes liver involvement. You can have just an internal organ that like the spleen is very vulnerable when you have an accident. Whatever the cause, not so much the liver as it's encapsulated, but you have internal organs that the bowel, the bladder, they can rupture. You can have quite a large volume of blood within the abdominal cavity before one recognizes that this patient has internal bleeding. And some of the classic signs of internal bleeding, patients go into shock, and shock means they're going to drop their blood pressure, become very tachycardic and just really short of breath and decrease level of consciousness. So you really need to pay close attention if you are that nurse admitting a trauma patient, even if they look like they've been doing okay, you need to pay close attention just in case you have those subtle changes. Well, we need to discuss once we've gotten past abdominal trauma, what happens to the patient with spinal trauma? Well, we know that the spine is one of those, uh, the spine runs, we have the spinal column and of course you have the spinal cord. We have what is called a very high network of nerves in that area. And depending where your injury is, that's where you're going to get your symptoms. In patients typically who have injuries of the spine from above C3, like C1, C2, C3, usually they have difficulty breathing and could easily wind up on a ventilator like the case of this patient. But I have seen a person, 
whom I knew rather well, who was involved in a car accident. Spine was very badly fractured in the cervical spine, but she did not have to have a collar. She, I mean, I'm sorry, they put on a ventilator. She had a normal, you could not even tell when you met her that she'd had any problems at all. She walked normally, drove a car, so it just depends. There's no one size fits all. Then you have those thoracic ones, vertebra, depending where the injury, like I said, where you get weaknesses in the arms and the shoulders. If it's lower down in the spine, you're going to get it in the feet and the thighs. And then you can do something called dermatomes where you do those pin pricks to establish how sharp or dull sensation is. The important thing with spinal injuries, some of them improve, some of them do not over a period of time. Um, I've worked with a nurse who said she had a spinal injury and they said she'd never walk again. And she was telling me the story as a nurse. She was walking. She lived a very normal life. So you cannot just write it off and say just because someone's had a spinal injury they will never have a normal uh, life anymore. It doesn't work that way. You just do the best you can with these patients. And typically when there is a lot of swelling immediately following trauma, it's very hard to tell what's going to happen for the future. So. Uh, Usually what you have in any institution that you work, you follow the doctor's instructions. Sometimes with some spinal injuries, they're put on a solumedrol drip immediately following the injury so that they can decrease that swelling around the spine. Whatever it is, just follow your institution's instructions. And of course, if you'd like to know more about spinal trauma, I suggest you go to uh, dearness.com and read about the aftermath. There's one thing we would, I'd like to discuss. Um, Spinal injuries, typically, we always think of having that trauma patient who is paralyzed from the waist down. Well, there is something which is rather special called central cord syndrome. I've not really seen it that often over all these years, probably two or three cases, where it happens the opposite way. And in these patients, what you have is full use of the low extremities, and they have loss of motion or very little use of their upper extremities. I saw the case of a young man one time. He was pushed into a pool and wound up having that kind of injury. He had full use of his legs, but he could barely raise his arms. And so if you would like to know more about spinal injuries, I suggest you go to dearnurses.com. There are some other ones that might be of help to you too, reading about assessment from head to toe, one, two, and three. So we hope to see you again. We hope to talk more about uh, topics that are directly related to the injured patient after they've had uh, not so much that like shock when they go into things like hypovolemic shock. So stay posted for more clinical information. Have a great week.